last week there were a few things that so um Lubhal and I also met on Thursday or Wednesday and then we were able to talk that we are going to be like putting the first release for the plugin um so getting things ready for that which is an important sort of goal here to you know, make sure that everything that's being emitted from the cloud events Jenkins as a source is the is the data that we need. Um, so one of the first thing was going back and making sure that all of the um, the, the data and the fields that we have on for all of the um, the cloud events um, data field, I guess it's it's updated and it's also being. Uh, like it's sort of changed between different listeners. So I can show you an example of, I, I wasn't really sure what all um, data we we're going to need. So I did look into sort of the older uh, plugins that are already there and got uh, the data for the cloud events attributes and just cloud events headers from there. And also let me just Um, so let me actually go back to the So there were a few things for the Q model and also, um, so what this is doing is basically the Q cause that we see here. Um, it's only being set for Q entered or Q um, moved from one step to another step. So going back into Q cause model itself, um, I thought that it'd be easier if some of the fields are not, if they're null, they're just not being sent along with the data. Uh, so for example, if it's, um, I'm ignoring some fields here, but in job model, I'm including them only uh, if the fields are not like not null. So for example, the build or the created date. So the created date is being used only when a job is being created. And I'm using this similar model for also when um, a job runs and changes the state from job started or job failed or job completed. So I didn't want, you know, create a date or updated date or build field. So build field is containing the build model, which is uh, information about the, the build of a run itself. So things like the, the timestamp when something started or when something ended, uh, the, the display name, the parameters which are being passed. Another thing I, let me just give sort of a demo about the, the data itself. Also, I did try running this on Kubernetes. So should I just sort of um, start that up and display the data being sent from Kubernetes or should I, um, do you guys wanna see on my local setup or would just checking on Kubernetes would be a better idea? I, I didn't get your last remark, Shruti. Um, so I, I, I said that uh, I have it running on Kubernetes. So what I'm going to do is instead of have it displayed from my local uh, Jenkins server, I'm going to um, display the plugin from Kubernetes itself. And then we can look at the, the data and the fields which are being emitted for different events which are emitted. So just... Uh, just keep keep that in mind that this is not my local system, but this is running on maybe an external server. Yeah, that would be better actually. That would be very nice. Um, yeah, we could do that. Are you also planning to show this demo during your nineteenth demo? Um, yeah, uh, just uh, I I also the recording I have done it with Kubernetes and local both, but I'm gonna go back and check which is better in terms of which has more clarity and information, um, and then I'm going to share that. Uh, okay, so the, running inside of AKS um, Amazon's Kubernetes. I'm just going to. I'm just going to make sure that this is the, okay. 
So I have, um, I, I did an earlier version where I had two replicas running on three different nodes, but these, um, all of these nodes are actually sort of like high, um, high charging machines. So they do charge me a lot for the VMs which are running, like the nodes which are running. Um, so I just uh, to tune them down to two and I have a single replica running uh, on both of these. Um, why don't you use Minikube? Um, I just, I had um, AKS running earlier, like before, but before this, like the project, I just did not have, I had a single node, which is like a scale node. So I just thought I'm going to spin that up again. Uh, it's also sort of fine. I do have credits for it. So it's, it's kind of fun using um, credits. I'm not going to use them otherwise. Shruti, if you run low on credits or running low, um, do let us know. We may be able to source something for you because I, I would not want you to be spending out of pocket for this. That is, that's not necessary. <laughs> oh, thank you. That sounds that sounds really nice. But I feel like I have um, sufficient credits or I don't think that that's going to happen. But either way, thank you so much. That's really amazing. OK. Uh, I'm also going to restart this because it's kind of uh, All right, so. So this is going to, um, since, you know, all of the events are selected, I can start with um, queue causes that I was talking about entered waiting. So the queue causes will be uh, inside of the event data only when it's either in the entered waiting stage or it has moved from one stage to another. And this is the entry time. I this, So this is still like Unix timestamp. And I think mm -hmm. that for, uh, I'm not really sure, but I think it might be better to keep it this way because it's much easier for, it would be much easier for the sync if, if they happen to use the entry time or the exit time uh, to, to you know, convert it in whatever format that they would like. So I kept it in this particular time format, but we can change it if, if um, you guys think that that might be a better option. In terms of the header, we have the um, specification version. So it's 1.0, the ID, which is, so it says it's UID, the C type, the source. Um, so the source is, uh, this, so this is the, uh, yeah, so this is like the, the resource. This is going to be the job and then the job name itself. Uh, queue left, it has the entry time and the exit time both, but it does not have uh, like queue causes. It does not have any sort of information about what happened to that particular stage that the queue is in. Uh, so it's, it's just not present. So it did not have the need to put it here. And so this was one thing in, uh, in, the, in the build or like the job started or job ended. I did try putting in SCM state, for example, like from GitHub or I, I tried it from GitHub. And what this was doing is every time a job had started, it was pulling the other version of uh, the this the commit ID or the commit shot, the older version, and it like job started would be the older version. For example, the, the previous SHA is 051. So whenever a job is started, it would be 051. And when it moves from one stage to another, completed or finalized, it would pull the newer version. And then um, when I can also also show that, I'm going to swear on the And I'm not really sure why this is that this is doing that, uh, but but that was something that was happening in terms of the parameters. I can test setting that up and. Uh, also, so this was the job updated um, event right from here. So this has config file added to it. 
And I, I, I do think that this can be important if someone is trying to uh, get information about a particular job or a particular project from inside the configuration files, which is not the case for here. And alongside that, we have we also have the updated date. And whenever a job is created, that would have the created date instead of the updated date. So, so I just thought that instead of having the like started date as null, I just maybe not put it here. Uh, and because I was looking through events from different other systems, Kinetic and Tekton and um, all the other systems that are using or having cloud events, I just found that not a lot of those systems have information being emitted as null. So we can maybe have something like, okay, started date is null and updated date is whatever, or similar information that I, I have not included um, over here. So if I was to go with some parameters, So the, the parameters are here, and I'm also going to go back to I have to set up another job, but um, do you guys get an idea of the the SEM state that I'm talking about? It was doing this really weird thing. So every time um, I suppose push to the main branch, and that is the branch that is being tracked, uh, it, it gets a new commit ID. And so this is the updated commit ID. So whenever a job would start, so this particular event right here, SCM state URL branch commit, the commit would have the older branch for jobs started. And then moving to job.completed or job.finalized, it would have that updated new commit ID. And then if that job was started again, maybe by, maybe I triggered it from the UI or maybe it was just started by pulling the SCM, it would have, again, the, older version of the the commit ID than what actually is the new updated version. Does that make sense? And I'm not I'm not really sure why that is happening. I tried it with different um, systems and that still was giving the same sort of error. I don't know if that's an actual error or it's 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 just how it is. But will you guys happen to have an idea on that? Not really sure about the SCM state. Sorry, could, could you repeat the question? Um, yes. So, so I had SCM added to um, uh, the, like the version that I was running on my local Jenkins server. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, you know, like pull SCM and whenever like something is pushed to the master branch, um, just trigger that particular job. Mm -hmm. So, do you, do you can you see this SCM state uh, like field on the on like VS Code to the right of the screen? Um. Yes. Yes. So, so I don't have it added to this particular job, but uh, let's look at job dot. So this is a job dot started. So whenever I push a whenever I push to the main branch, and this is the like this is the branch that's being tracked inside of uh, Jenkins, and then it's pulling this particular branch. So whenever I push to it, it would have a new updated commit char commit ID. Uh, and so whenever you know, it's pulling, and then a job would start, the SCM state for job dot started event commit would be older um, ID, the older commit ID instead of the, the newer commit ID. And then it would move to job.completed or job.finalize. And here inside of the job.completed or job.finalize, 
finalized as CM State, it would have the new, the recently pushed um, Comet's ID. But it, but for the job that started, it was still giving me the older ID, and every time it would, it would refresh every time that a newer Comet is pushed or a newer um, job is it started, but it still was not the one which is currently the most latest comment which which pushed to which like started this job it was the the previous version so like ver like comment id minus one of whatever started it so that yeah. is pretty weird and i don't know why that is happening yeah i don't know off the top of my head either unfortunately uh, that, yeah that that can be a problem um. Think. Maybe if you can show an example. Yes, I'm trying to. The, the comet ID is showing as like the one older version okay. than like the newer one that should be on there. Yeah, okay, so that is an It's like a syncing issue, like in a way, is it? Like it's showing the older right. comment. That it's... Right. Yeah, I actually don't know because every time like it's only job like it's only for every time a job has just started. When it moves to job completed, it is that particular new version. It's not like the older comment. Let me. Hmm. Would the oh, newer one need a checkout? No, it's it's all added and it gets triggered. The only it's just inside of the payload that the problem exists. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm not able to add my. I also uh, looked at I sort of um, googled it and people were like oh maybe try specifying um, your branch as origin main or something similar and i did try doing all of those things it just did not work if it seems like it's an issue with uh jenkins like the payload is not being populated correctly um, i think we can raise this issue with uh, the other other members in jenkins i think this, it would be a good good idea yeah i think it it could be, yeah. But if it doesn't, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll make a video after the meeting and I'll send it to you as just to sort of demonstrate that this is working. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I think for now, what we should do is uh, what you have here is like pretty good stuff. Uh, what we should do right now is we should uh, focus on the upcoming um, demo that we have. So for that, uh, so on on Friday, we had a meeting, right? In which we discussed that, I think it'd be better if we release a new version of the Cloud Events plugin, so that along with your demo, we have a new version as uh, which people can use. And then we, we can go into like a feedback mode for the second half of the project so that we can improve along those lines as well as, you know, what we think, uh, we should probably do and that will help us give a better idea of how people will end up using the plugin itself so for this um i think for now uh it's let's let's not uh, let's not get hung up on this one small thingy uh what we'll do is uh we'll just uh, focus on the release and then as we discussed uh and i would love to have your opinion on this so uh, mm, guys so I was thinking initially we should just uh, release 
is for the sync implementation and make it perfect. Uh, I think it's already perfect actually. Uh, we just maybe need a little more documentation, a little more tests. And uh, after we release that, then we, then we can continue uh, working on the moving the configuration from global configuration to uh, the cloud events uh, under managed Jenkins. And then after that, we could probably do, you know, Jenkins, uh, sorry, Jenkins as a source, I mean, not saying Jenkins as a source, then we work on uh, uh, moving the configuration. And then after that, we can work on, you know, doing syncs uh, in Jenkins. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. Um, so, so that I'm clear, what, what you've just said is that for both the demo and for the first release, it will be Jenkins as a source, not as a sync, and we will do those in further iterations. Is that is that right? Yes. Okay. So, because so that you know people can get started with the uh, you know yeah uh, deriving yeah. information from Jenkins. So yes, and we had questions on how exactly Jenkins would be how to implement the sync. So actually, if we have a version out that people can reference, it, it will help. I think get more feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think if in the second phase we go into this uh, feedback loop with uh, users, I think it will be much better as, as like experience in GSOC as well. And like, uh, because the first phase, you know, you kind of like build it up and second phase, you can uh, get in more touch with the community, maybe do like some uh, focus more on kind of like evangelizing a little bit of the plugin itself. So I think that would be that would be a good step forward. Yeah, that's um, and yes, that's a really good idea. And I have added more tasks. I like I think that yes, the documentation is really important for it. And I am um, creating. I have um, it's just a text document where I have pulled all of this event data. Uh, and you know how maybe Tecton has, or even how other cloud event um, systems, even Knata has good documentation on this on what type of event gets submitted and here's what it looks like alongside the headers. Uh, and we can, if, do you think that putting all of that inside of just maybe the main readme doc, that's, that's a good idea, or maybe we can you know, move that into each specific listener? Um. I have noticed one thing with Jenkins uh, plugins is that the readme that we have for it is uh, directly shown uh, on the plugins page. So if you go to, go to plugins.jenkins. Uh, io, I think that's what it's called. Uh, the readme that we have for uh, readme.mb that we have is the same thing that is shown there. So mm -hmm. we can stuff as much information as we want on the readme and keep that as like a single source of truth for the entire plugin and that would that be completely fine if anything it would be much better because the users don't have to go to like you know different docs if so if we want to kind of uh, uh, differentiate between user docs and developer docs we could do we could do that but uh, like user docs would be the readme and the developer docs would be something else but i think to start off we can stuff everything on this readme uh, and then I think that that would be that would be good. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and I was oh, so the the video that I um what referred to earlier, I did just mention about Jenkins as a sink and what we are thinking of doing. Uh, you know, just to sort of give an idea of here's what people can expect. And it is a bit aligned above with the, the sockeye that we showed earlier. Mm -hmm. And how to figure that. And I did also create um, a, like a YAML file um, of what it can be or what it can like, what Jenkins is a sync configuration can look like. Mm -hmm. uh, so if maybe we can talk a bit about that too right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so what I was thinking is um, inside of, you know, having filters, so a person is configuring Jenkins as a sync, so there would be sort of this field of filters where it could be cloud events metadata, or cloud events um, event body or event data. 
So those they, those can be like the two broad fields where someone might want to filter it by the cloud events metadata or by the cloud events data itself. So configuring that might help us figure out what information can we extract from either the um, the headers or the body as in like the metadata or the event data. And I also thought that um, inside of, you know, the actions that a certain user might want to trigger, what we can do is have an option of, okay, is this action parameterized or not? Just how, you know, Jenkins does is this build parameterized. And um, if it is, you might want to add parameters. So actions, a person chooses, yes, to start a build of a job. And a person then selects, yes, this particular action is parameterized and this will be receiving parameters from um, the event which is coming in, right? So this is just happening. A configuration is happening in Jenkins as a sync. Um, so yes, this particular action is parameterized and inside of that particular, you know, if it's parameterized or not, it can be, okay, where is that parameter present, whether it's inside event body or whether it's inside event metadata. And then obviously um, whatever a person selects then actually entering the, the parameter that someone might be looking for, for example, in Tecton, whether it's um, inside of, you know, if a person selects, okay, the parameter is actually going to be inside of event um, body and the parameter is uh, a field in task run. So I, I don't know, it, it's YAML is, with YAML you can sort of overachieve, <laughs> but I don't know how exactly we can move this inside of um, Jenkins, but I feel like having the JavaScripts and having, um, if you're trying to run a framework, it might be easier to go that sort of direction of dynamic filtering. Mm -hmm. what, what do you guys think of that? Um wherever we can allow the user to use regex probably could allow them but i don't know how that would work um that's why i refer back to the common expression language that was there uh, mm -hmm. uh, we could if there is a java library for it we could probably just uh, use use that actually but i'm not sure because if the cel has a go library um i think it should probably would be I think they should have a Java library actually. Mm -hmm. um, okay, they have CL, C++ and Go. They don't have Java. But there's, there's the spec. But we wouldn't want to <laughs> implement CL. That would be, that would be a pain. I, like we can, um do similar sort of implementation inside, just like a simple um, matching and filtering of, you know, if it's just like a, like a string coming in and we might want to filter it with just regular expressions. Uh, like we can achieve that. I think we might not really need um, common expression if we are just sort of doing that simple matching. No, if we do the simple matching, I don't think we need, a, need the CEO stuff. Like if we just, uh, you know, do the prefix, post, uh, postfix, I think, uh, and uh, matching uh, substring, like if we do all this stuff, I think it'll be fine to start with. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, what I had, I was like sort of thinking is I did not have like regular expression fields inside of um, the, like the metadata or the data itself, but more inside of the actions where a person is selecting parameters. Mm -hmm. um, but we can, you know, we can like put that both in both of those places when a person is selecting filters and when a person is entering parameters for the particular action. Um, I was just like looking at different events and, you know, look, looking at them, I just, I thought that if if a certain um, sort of a field is present inside of the cloud events metadata, then it will be present 
like whatever a person might be looking for. For example, if it's a it's it's a tech town event, if someone is looking for a task around a particular um, idea of a task run, it is going to be present inside of a body. So just giving users the ability to also filter by the body and also enter parameters from the body as well. It plus the headers, of course. And yeah, I think filtering inside of the headers, uh, it's it's never a bad idea to, you know, give users all the ability to configure it the way they want. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to also think of filtering in um, the, the filters itself, like the regular expression filters. Um, there might be, there might be times where we have to figure out what is the best way to uh, uh, filter the body. Um, maybe maybe we can come up with examples for that uh, because just like match won't work in this case. At, at those points, we, we might have to do stuff like, you know, pick up, uh, pick up certain information from the body itself. So I think in those cases, um, we'll have to work with, uh, like those cases will arise when we are doing more sync stuff and we are, you know, doing a real world application such as, you know, working with Tekton or something. But I think uh, that is still um, ahead in the game right now. So what we'll do for now is uh, um, let's, let's work on the, um, Let's let's work on the actual uh, configuration bits for the sync first, and see like how it does. Like we'll do like multiple iterations of it, and then uh, kind of uh, and how many of our iterations you do from that, we'll figure out okay which one works out best. So we'll take that part, and uh, because uh, most of this is just going to be a lot of trial and error, uh, especially with the syncs. Um, so like what I was thinking is, mm -hmm. for example, if here's an body, right, inside yeah. of the event body and uh, a person select that they want to trigger build of a job mm -hmm. and yes, the build of a job is parameterized and then parameters are inside of event body instead of like event metadata. Mm -hmm. You know, the regular expression, we can have something like, since this is an array, um, yeah. like uh, the parameter includes or like the parameter contains, I, like includes obviously makes more sense here. It includes this particular object. Mm -hmm. Or if it's like an object itself, it can be like it like contains this particular field. And uh, if it's like stead field, it can obviously sort of go in like a nested direction of um, mm -hmm. this, means this, and like the condition includes a message, be like this particular message. Mm -hmm. sure. Again, because each event, if you like go in and look at uh, a K native event, they have a different way how they are defining their events. And you know, not everything here is an array or um, not everything could be an object. So maybe just, just thinking of how the matching might not only be matching of strings, mm -hmm. but objects or, or arrays or even, um, I don't know, like something as complex like an entire field or an object. What we could do instead of regex because it's not very intuitive to, because what we'll have to do in that those cases, you know, uh, look at uh, the existing, or uh, like the user will have to look at the existing payloads and then mm -hmm. figure out the regex based on that. But what is better if that the user doesn't have to go through go through that path? So I was thinking if we could do something like dollar, uh, dollar uh, period, and then you know uh, whatever, task run dot creation timestamp. And you know, task run dot metadata dot creation timestamp. So that dollar uh, that the user gives, it will replace. Uh, it it doesn't have to be dollar. It could be something else as well. But it that would replace the payload that we are giving. Uh, 
that the, the cloud events plugin is receiving at that point. And, and, the, and then the creation timestamp would be used uh, for like a parameter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes, um, yes, that makes sense. And uh, just one thing. So, um, can we think of any events which might not be like parameterized, but just like the last time that we were talking and the idea of stopping the build of the job came up, right? And um, Risha suggested something really good, which was like, which was if a certain parameter is present inside of it, then stop that particular build, else just stop the last build that's running. Uh, so I, I was just thinking that it can be complex to understand where to get that, you know, value from. So it's like, how can we um, sort of like trigger an event, which mm -hmm. is a default version, but also it does not mess up the current, like whatever is being run or whatever is whatever has to be stopped, you know? Because yes, a, per a user can supply information about a build that can be that has to be stopped inside of like the the, the event body or inside of like the parameters and for our um, sync configuration, but how, like, I, I think that that can be sort of confusing of where to get that information from, and then also to configure it inside of the plugin itself. So let me reiterate what you said, example. Um... So uh, you're saying that what if we want to stop a build? Like that's the last thing we discussed, right? Um, mm -hmm. Stop a build uh, based on certain param uh, parameters given in the payload that we receive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that what you asked? Uh, yes, but like, but, but what if that particular, yes, like a person is looking for, here is the parameter. Mm -hmm. um, and particular like value and like stop this bill if that particular you know parameter is being received um so like a person has configured that parameter so um stop a bill when like yes the the generate name is curl run whatever then you have to stop this particular build mm -hmm. so but I it actually kind of uh, reminds me of TCP for some reason because um, this is this is kind of not easy to do uh, because what you because what you're saying is the um, system needs to know like what is the name of the uh, you know mm -hmm. like build which is going to be something random or like uh, an arbitrary number and what or what is going to be the name of the task run because task runs also have like arbitrary names like they usually uh, don't they usually work with generate names right so um like it it could be something like like this could be something we discuss with the uh, cd foundation guys in which we figure out like a way in which there's like a sin act happening so like uh, imagine the cloud event that is being sent by tecton to jenkins is a sin Okay, it's like a synchronization phase, and then uh, an event is triggered. Oh, sorry, the event triggers a build. Okay, now uh, based on that, the uh, name of the build is returned back to the uh, uh, from Jenkins to Tecton uh, because they have been configured to do that, and like then Tecton knows which uh, which build has been triggered. So there'll, there'll be a build number there. So, and after that, uh, like, and that's how, that's how Tecton will know that this build has been created by uh, Jenkins. So that's like a syn act. 
So that's like the second phase of TCP, right? So this mm -hmm. we might have to send out a new event back uh, to Tekton, and then based on that, you know, Tekton would do something to be like, okay, this is completed. But you know, actually, you're discussing something that has I I don't know if it has been discussed before. So this and uh, the I think there are like talks going on. I think there is already like work being done to uh, kind of store the state of uh, events uh, and you know link them together. And this is this is the problem that we are discussing right now. So like linking events together is. Uh, is is what is what we are talking about. So we have to probably yeah. figure out, you know, how this might work. And I'm not the best person to talk about this. We might have to take this conversation up with Mauricio, probably. Yeah. Um. Yes. Thanks, Bhavit. Like, um, it does make sense. And you know, since events, especially, we are since this is like an interoperable system, we are not only building a single service or just like Jenkins tech on just looking at events from different systems and thinking what kind of payload can be sent and how or can we map what needs to be done and then sending it back yeah and and creating it in a way which is abstracted and also not dependent or not really attached to a particular system it's pretty hard to just think about but um, I'm like finding resources and <laughs> looking at ways that is pretty fun. Yeah, um, this is this is very interesting problem to solve. It's um, it's just it's just that, uh, but but this is a problem which is probably discussed further with uh, you know the community because at, mm -hmm. I I don't know if Andrea has already faced this issue or like has thought of this issue in Tekton and kept in POC. Um, but I think even, uh, I think he, he would be interested to discuss this further as well. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Because, um, so this, basically, this basically tells us that we need to, uh, like even in the Tekton payload, we probably need to have like a synchronization block. I don't know how that works, but we probably need to have that and, uh, probably need to go look back at you know uh, the like some like protocols such as TCP and see how they store this information and you know how this could be interpreted in something like events which is not a uh, which is not a lower level protocol oh my god I am getting all of my networking here <laughs> yeah but <laughs> But uh, yeah, we need to we need to figure this out not just between ourselves but with the community because this is not an easy problem. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, I I hope that um, so the next cloud events safe meeting is on the nineteenth, and I mm -hmm. have uh, like I'm obviously really wanting to join, and I hope that I'll be able to join. And maybe take some of our questions there and also just hear about what or how they have built the current adapters and system for um, Tekton Jenkins and K native Tekton Jenkins. Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, we should we should definitely bring this up in the next meeting. So it's uh, next Monday. So if yeah, you want, uh, next so next Monday is also your 19th is the uh, is the day you have to demo this stuff. So what we could do that day is um, so when is the demo exactly? Um, the sure. demos will be on the week of the 19th, but we haven't chosen the exact date and time yet. Please please respond to the doodle. You <laughs> send the email and what's in the Slack as well. Um, if you haven't yet, I know shuchi has been great about about filling in her details. Yeah, I'm just uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, hopefully hopefully I'll be able to announce that soon. And also, if you can think of a better time, I tried to make the times. I mean, I guess it's because I'm in Europe, so I wanted to make it European friendly, and then it would. I really wanted to make it APAC friendly because um, that is really important for all our students this year, as well as most of the mentors or a lot of the mentors. So hopefully that is true. If you all can think of a better time that somehow I just, I don't know, I then let me know. 
somehow getting this a global time slot is, is very, <laughs> it's very difficult to arrange. Yeah. You suggest I'm... amazing times, Cara. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, um, so it's the week of the 19th, so yes. like 19th up till 23rd, right? Yes, that's right. But you are doing a pre-recorded demo, which you have, but you may edit or not. I mean, I, I'm sure what you have is very good. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I, I'll go through it again. And so I, I still think that on the 19th, we'll be able to do this meeting and then the meeting right after, which is for cloud events and move the, the demonstration to the 20th or the 21st, if you guys are okay with it, of course. Um, but if not, I, I um, cloud events say they, they are recording the meeting, so we can just maybe post our questions on the, the Slack channel for, um, I think it's, it's called cloud events. I'm not really sure. That sounds good. It would be good to make the meeting there. So maybe we'll explicitly choose not to overlap with them. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I don't have any, anything um, to add right now. And I will send the, as soon as I'm able to configure the, um, the Git SCM thing that I was talking about, I will send it to you guys, maybe a video or maybe just um, screenshots. Uh, and also, working on like right now i'm basically working on adding more tests and also just making sure that the data that's being uh emitted and it kind of makes sense for the events again do you guys think that it's better to have null fields so you know uh, for a job that's updated it's better to have like started or like created time as null or updated time is whatever then just not having that field at all. Because as I showed earlier, I just decided to not either serialize those fields or not just include them at all. But just, just you know, just wanting to hear what do you guys think about the event field? I was thinking if, yeah, if, if the field is null, then it probably shouldn't be in the payload. But I don't know how I feel about that really. I don't have much information with uh, like uh, sending a lot of data uh, like related to something. Maybe maybe the null is necessary, uh, you know, like uh, maybe having the key itself is kind of, kind mm -hmm. of important. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking too. Um. I was thinking that maybe if someone is trying to filter things by, you know, created date and just created date is not there. Mm -hmm. And maybe if someone is trying to parse and there's just unnecessary data and maybe you just don't need that created field, created date field at all, why include it? Yeah, <laughs> but there might be, uh, there might be cases where we would like to keep the field and mm -hmm key at least key and whatever value is null but at that point when the user is parsing the data um we shouldn't have a null pointer exception on our side you know they they could uh, when the user is uh, passing the parameters they could probably have null as a string um mm -hmm. but i don't know how i feel about that really so Yeah, actually neither. Um, but yeah, so the fields that are absolutely sort of essential, I have kept them even if those are null. Uh, for example, I don't know, maybe just event or maybe just like job name, maybe that's just null for some reason, I don't know. But feels like those, but where I thought, okay, I'm not really sure if this might be helpful. I have, I just chose without really, you know, maybe like thinking a lot about how it might be looking like for a user who's receiving this event and just to remove that rather than sending it over as enough. But um, mm. yeah, still, still not sure. For example, like SCM, like as you guys 
uh, we're looking earlier, it was null, even then, even when it was, wasn't was configured. So if someone is like, okay, is this SCM configured? No, it's null. Um, but certain fields obviously don't exist if they're null. Mm -hmm. I'll probably think more about that. And um, okay, that's and that's that's it for me. If you guys have any suggestions and feedback on anything, um, especially for anything that's like Jenkins as a source related, so that can be included uh, for the week of the presentations, and I can include that in my presentation. Um, so when you're doing Jenkins as a source, I would, it would be nice if you could uh, uh, send, uh, send, like configure the sync as uh, the uh, Sockeye sync. Um, yeah. so if you want, we can, uh, we can reconvene on that and you know, figure out how to do that. But I think it should be pretty straightforward because uh, when it comes to giving a presentation, uh, I think uh, showing the cloud events in Sockeye would be actually very nice. And anyways, when you're able to run these, uh, run run this on uh, Minikube, so well, like we can you know give users like a end-to-end -end, um, kind of like a, not a, not really solution of anything, but like end-to-end -end, uh, solution of uh, you know you have Jenkins and then you've got Sockeye and to like you know, see how this works, you can just set this up this way and you could just make a small repo in which you have this uh, bash script which just uh, runs all of this uh, or like at least gives instructions on, on how, to, how to run all of this. So I think that'd be a good place to start out like for the demo. That's my, yeah. that's my, only, uh, that's my only point. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion. Thanks a lot. And that sounds interesting too. <laughs> but let me know, like, if you want some help to set up the uh, software. Um, mm -hmm. It should be pretty straightforward on Minikube. Um, but yeah, let me know. Thank you. I think um, that's maybe it. Okay. Awesome. Good. Thank you all. Uh, great meeting. And I really look forward to seeing your demo, Shruti. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. Bye, y'all. Thank you, everyone. Great work, Shruti. Thanks, everyone.